Today's seminar will be about the size and scale of the universe, from the very small to the very large, and everything in between. Okay, so if you've ever come to the astronomy program before, you know this is a very dynamic program. This is really a lot of fun. Um, Kevin used to work for NASA, and I won't even get into his accreditations, but um, this guy, let's just say he knows what he's talking about. We're very lucky to have him. This is uh, Dr. Professor <laughs> Kevin Manning. So uh, we're going to turn it over to him and his Astronomy for Everyone seminar will begin right now. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Let's give Josh a hand for all the hard work he does here, shall we? Yeah, good to try. All right. Well, thank you all for coming to my program today. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. Uh, this will be the last time I'm here for, for quite a while. So uh, uh, it, it, I, I wanted to come back and see you before I left the area. So uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, you all, and thank you so much for coming. Today's program is Astronomy for Everyone, Size and Scale of the Universe. So we're going to be talking about the universe from the very small to the very large, and everything in between as well. I always like to begin my program with a quote from a famous scientist. In this case, you all know his name. The Hubble Space Telescope was named after this gentleman. Equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls experience or adventure science. The word science comes from a Latin word, sciere, S-C-I-R-E, which literally means to know. So as we dare to look up and wonder at the splendor of a starry sky, the appeal of astronomy may be beckoning. Submit to it in the slightest and you may get hooked. Once you do, the universe and your place in it will never look the same. Astronomy is an experience that allows us to pace ourselves. So take heart. You can go as slowly or as quickly as you like. The universe is a very patient place, one that doesn't mind waiting while we take the first steps towards understanding. If we stare into the night long enough, gaseous nebulae begin to emerge and glittering star clusters show up on the scene as well, sort of like the Christmas tree over there. And if we continue staring into the dark night, perhaps a blazing fireball briefly interrupts the calm. How many have seen meteors before? Yeah, we call them shooting stars, though that's a misnomer. They're not stars at all. Little pebble-sized pieces of rock traveling through space. Well, through a telescope, we can see much more. How many here have seen the rings of Saturn <coughs> through a telescope before? How many was it with my telescope? Okay, <laughs> yeah. How many would like to see the rings of Saturn? Okay, well, we're going to try to make that happen sometime for you, because you got to see the rings of Saturn. It's really incredible. Isn't it, Roberta? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, frankly speaking, the craters on the moon would stun even the most composed beginner. Don't you agree, Philip? The craters on the moon were amazing in the telescope. And the colors on the planets show up, as well as the polar caps on Mars, are within easy reach, as well as hundreds of galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. So how do we see all these things in space? Well, we begin by using our eyes, don't we? This is a close-up photograph of the human eye. We're not used to seeing it this close, are we? As a matter of fact, from this closest, it looks a bit creepy, doesn't it? And here, you see the color part of the eye, we call the iris, and in the middle, this aperture or opening known as the pupil. How many have ever noticed in a mirror your own pupil change size? <coughs> yeah, you know, bright sunny day, the pupil is rather small and squinty. Dark night with few lights around, it'll open up to a maximum of seven millimeters, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. So to enhance our vision, we use the telescope, the primary tool of the astronomer. When it comes to optical or visual astronomy, there are two basic designs. These two in the upper right of our screen uses a lens, so when light comes through that lens, it is bent or refracted, converging as a cone to a focus back here at the focal plane. Well, because that design refracts light, we simply call them refractor telescopes. These two in the lower left of our screen uses a mirror. Light comes in a basically hollow tube and strikes the surface of that mirror, which is curved inward like a spoon. We call that a concave curve, and by virtue of that curvature in that reflective surface, light rays will also converge to a focus. Well, because that design uses mirrors that reflect light, we simply call them reflector telescopes. Here's sunlight reflected off of the moon, traveling all the way back to the Earth, 
right through the slit opening of our dome of our observatory at the speed of light. You know the speed of light is the fastest thing we know of? It's 186,000 miles per second. And if we go metric, it's even worse. A much bigger number, isn't it? 300,000 kilometers per second. Well, what does that mean? It means we can go around the Earth, not once or twice, but seven and a half times in one second. How many would like to go around the world seven and a half times in one second? That would be the speed of light. It will take us from the Earth to the moon and back, round trip, in less than three seconds. How many would like to visit the moon in 1.3 seconds? That's the speed of light. And at that enormous speed, how far will we travel in an entire year? Well, that's a light year defined. We can easily calculate it knowing its speed. We can multiply that large number times the seconds, minutes, hours, and days in a year. What do you get after all that math besides a possible headache? Well, a very large number, it's just under 6 trillion miles in one light year. And I'm not talking about the deficit, which is over double that and growing. Yeah, 6 trillion miles, that's an awful big measuring stick. But we do have a bigger one than that we use in astrophysics. Let's try a little experiment together, shall we? Everyone, please, hold your index finger up in front of your eyes like I am mine. Would you try it? Close your left eye so you see your finger with your right eye only. And then close your right eye and look at your finger with your left eye and the background beyond respectfully as well. Now blink back and forth between your eyes while looking at your finger. Yeah, it looks like it's moving. Now you know you're not moving your finger. So could it be our left eye is looking at the finger from this angle and over here on the other side of our head our right eye is looking at the same finger from a different angle? Aren't we forming a little triangle when we do that? How many heard of triangulation? A method measure distances of objects. Yes. It'll work for a star even beyond a light year away. Well, we'll come back to that biggest measuring stick in a moment, but you know what? Any Star Trek fans here? All right, I'm not alone. Very good. Well, few of you in this room are old enough to remember the original series when it came out in 1966, and we're all grown up. Hey, we're no spring chickens anymore, are we? But anyhow, <laughs> I think some of you are older than me in this room. I'm not sure, but anyhow. My son was a big fan. Yes, Star Trek is an awesome show. Well, I watched it faithfully the whole time it was on air. Did anybody here catch the recent movies of Star Trek? Yeah, weren't they great, Josh? They were awesome. Well, there's a third new movie in that new series of Star Trek films about to come out. And guess who has a starring role in that new movie? You William Shatner. No, I wish, not me. Uh, I wish Joshua, maybe. But no, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, will be back in that show. A little pudgier than he used to be, but he'll be back in that, in that new program. Well, I can't wait till it comes out. How about you? So, our telescopes, reflectors and refractors, like the top middle one here, sort of reminds me of binoculars. Anybody own a pair of binoculars? Yeah, you know they're great for bird watching here on Long Island, that's a big pastime. And they're also great for sporting events, the local high school football game. They're also great for astronomy. Do you know binoculars are nothing more than two of those refractor telescopes mounted side by side? The lenses on the front of our binoculars are doing all the work. These lenses are five times larger in diameter than the pupil of our eye reaches at maximum opening. Five squared, 25 times the light collecting area of our eye, revealing hundreds of stars that were totally invisible to the unaided eye. How many want to see the invisible? I got both hands up and feet. That's why we astronomers build bigger telescopes all the time, to enable us to see more of the invisible, fainter and dimmer stars further and deeper out in space. So knowing that, instead of this pair, how many would rather look for this pair instead? Yeah, I think we're voting for the big ones, right? Look at the size of those larger lenses compared to their smaller counterparts. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're going to gulp in and concentrate to a focus a lot more light than a smaller pair could, revealing hundreds of stars in this pair that were totally invisible with this pair. With this pair of binoculars, we can see the rings of Saturn. The craters on the moon, like we were going to land on it with the Apollo astronauts, and dozens of other galaxies as well. So I'll put these here. 
Okay, now it's a good idea to send telescopes into space, and we certainly have. This is known as NASA's four great observatories. They're all space telescopes. I've had a wonderful opportunity of using some of these instruments. In 1990, we launched this one, the Hubble Space Telescope. Doesn't look that big up on the screen, but it's actually the size of a school bus. It operates primarily in the visible region of the spectrum, <coughs> revealing images like this one of the Cat's Eye Nebula. 1991, we launched the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. It operated in high energy regions of space, gamma rays. 1999, it took three attempts when we finally got the Chandra X-ray Observatory in orbit on the space shuttle. I worked with that one with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. 2003, we launched the Spitzer Space Telescope, which operates primarily in infrared. Well, <coughs> in modern astronomy, <coughs> excuse me, we want to look across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays and everything in between. It gives us many more varied perspectives on these objects, lots more data and information, including the physical laws that govern their motion. Now, here's an image of our star, the sun. Anybody look at the sun lately? Yeah, it's not a good idea to do that, right? It's so bright, it's dangerous, it can even blind us. Highly unrecommended, right? <clears throat> well, with a proper filter applied to a telescope, we can see the sun as you see it here on the screen. Now, this is real video footage, so watch what happens when I set it in motion. <clears throat> yeah, the sun spins and rotates upon its axis, a lot like the Earth does, though it's a bit slower than we are. Near the equator of the sun, it takes about 25 days to spin around one time. Near the poles, it's even slower, about 33 days. We call that differential rotation. And notice these dark blotches on the sun right here. Anybody know what those dark blotches are called? What we call those spots. Yeah, sunspots, exactly. You know, they're magnetic storms that align with the magnetic field lines coming up from the core of the sun, where they meet the surface. And because they're magnetic in nature, they often form in these groups or pairs. Well, these sunspots don't look that big on the screen, do they? But what if I told you they're bigger than the Earth? They're much bigger than our entire planet. There's a nice sunspot group on the left side of the sun. What if we zoom in on that group in ultra-high definition? And this is what we see. Notice in the center of each sunspot, we have this dark middle region we call the umbra. Same root word we get the English word umbrella from. Surrounded by a lighter shaded region we call the penumbra. Same two terms we use to describe both the direct and indirect shadows of the moon blocking the sun during a solar eclipse. Notice on the sides of the sunspots, the surface of the sun itself appears rather mottled. We call it solar granulation. After all, the sun's a very hot place, you know. In the core where the heat is coming up from, it's 27 million degrees. That's hot enough to burn our bacon in the morning, wouldn't you agree? And here is the sun in ultraviolet, and right here is an area of a sunspot. Watch it closely in this real video footage. How many have heard of a solar flare before? And here's the sun in infrared, again, right here, an area of a sunspot. Watch it closely in this real video footage as well. Now that was definitely an ooh-ah moment. Some of you missed your cue, but that's okay. You know, the magnetic field line suppressing the material below until the pressure builds and it explodes forth with these electrically charged particles known as ions in a matrix known as plasma. Same phase of matter we see in lightning bolts and stars like the sun. Much of the plasma raining back down on the surface of the sun from its tidal forces or gravitational pull encompassing an area seen here on the screen that doesn't look very large, but it's actually bigger than the distance from the Earth to the Moon, hundreds of thousands of miles. And here is a newborn star. You know, we're a lot like stars, you and I. Stars are born, they live, and they die, though they tend to live a lot longer than we do, millions, billions, even trillions of years. Let me show you this visualization, everything that happens to a newly formed star. First, it's fusing hydrogen 
in the heavier elements, glowing with its own power. When all the hydrogen is used up, the core begins to collapse, but now it's burning heavier elements created through the fusion process on up the chain, which burn hotter so the star expands larger. Now when it reaches iron vapor in the core, there's a problem. Iron is so heavy it won't release energy, it only absorbs it. So gravity takes over and the star's core will begin to collapse in about a second of time, triggering a horrific, catastrophic explosion known as a supernova. Yes, in a moment of time, more energy has been released from this exploding star than it had been burning in the previous millions, even billions of years beforehand. So bright are these supernovae, we can see them at distant galaxies millions of light years away. The leftover gas and dust debris of our stellar explosion actually enriching that area of space so that the deaths of old stars can ultimately lead to the bursts of new stars. Stars glow with their own power, so we call them luminous objects. Other objects such as planets, moons, asteroids, comets are only illuminated by reflecting nearby starlight. Our nearest neighbor who does that with the sun, the moon. Though it looks like uh, we could reach out and grab a hold of the moon in the night sky, it appears so close. And relatively speaking, it is our nearest neighbor by far throughout the entire universe. But it does lie a distance of 240,000 miles away. Here is the sun using a, a filter. So what, what could that little dark ball be there silhouetted in front of the sun from our line of sight? Any guesses? It could be Mercury. Good job. Mercury is closer to the sun than we are. As a matter of fact, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun of all. And it orbits the sun in a mere 88 days. That means every so often it will line up with the line of nodes, we call it, and it will pass right in front of the sun's disk from our line of sight. Well, we call the event a transit, but this is not a transit of Mercury. Who else could this be? Venus. That's right. This is a transit of Venus. The only other planet closer than we are to the sun, right? We're the third rock from the sun on Earth. This is a transit of Venus where it passed right in front of the sun's disk. Jupiter, our largest planet in the entire solar system. It's 11 times larger in diameter than the Earth. And yet its day is less than half of ours. Jupiter spins and rotates on its axis in a mere 9 hours and 50 minutes, stretching along these stripes known as cloud belts. Our second largest planet, Saturn with its majestic rings. And in between the bright ring sections, we see this dark appearing gap known as Cassini's Division. And up near the pole of the planet, we notice this luminous arc visible there. It's actually an aurora. How many have seen the northern lights before? Yeah, we know they exist on the Earth, but they also exist on other worlds, such as Saturn. Saturn is a lot further away from the Sun than we are, averaging a distance of 0.9 billion miles. So it takes nearly 26 years for Saturn to orbit the Sun one time. That means every year we catch up to it, and when we do, we get different angular perspectives of the rings of Saturn. And here we see uh, an image of Saturn and many images taken up close and personal by the Cassini spacecraft and the Huygens probe. These are real images, this is not a cartoon. Real pictures of Saturn almost a billion miles away in space. A lot of people think the rings are made up of gas or dust but they're really hundreds of trillions of icy rocks orbiting that world, kept in the beautiful patterns and configurations by the tidal forces of these little shepherd moons. Speaking of moons, we have one moon orbiting the Earth, though it's very important to us. Without it, I dare say, we would not be here today. Saturn, on the other hand, is 63 moons at last count. Here's the biggest one of them. It's named Titan. Titan is nearly the size of planet Mars. It has an atmosphere, and it has water. Titan is the second largest moon in the entire solar system. And as Saturn flips around in our view, we see this other sizable moon coming our way called Minus. It has a large impact crater on the side facing us here. Mars, with its polar caps, and dark areas like this one known as Certus Major. 
of high interest to all because we believe long ago Mars was more Earth-like than it is today, having a thicker, denser, more robust atmosphere and an abundance of water above its surface. Well, we send a number of spacecraft and probe toward Mars. Does anybody remember the Viking mission? Viking 1, Viking 2, and its image on the surface of Mars? Hey, everybody got excited about that picture, right? We were all surprised. We thought Mars was going to be lush with vegetation and water, but it was a dry, barren, desert-looking landscape instead. We'll have that same surprise on a much bigger scale when we arrive at Pluto next year. Yes, we will actually get to Pluto nine years after we launched a spacecraft in January of 2006. And we arrive in the summer 2015. How many can't wait to see the pictures of Pluto up close and personal? I'm so excited I can't stand it. Anyhow. <laughs> Well, way beyond the planets of our solar system are stars in the Orion Cygnus arm of our own Milky Way galaxy. Forming these asterisms or patterns in the sky, like you may recognize here, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is not a constellation, but it's part of one known as Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Seven stars makes up the Big Dipper, three in the handle and four in the bowl, and these two at the end of the bowl, opposite the handle, are commonly referred to as pointers. Line them up and keep going that direction off the screen and they point in the general direction of our current North Star. Who knows the name of the North Star? Polaris. Polaris, very good. That's its name. How many heard that Polaris is the brightest star visible in the entire night sky? How many have heard that before? Don't be shy. Most Americans have heard that. And that's why I like to bring it up at my programs because that's totally not true. <laughs> Polaris is even close to being the brightest star, not by a long shot. So what's the name of the real brightest star visible in the entire night sky? I thought it was the North Star. No, it's not. No? No, nope. Polaris is only a second magnitude star. It's really dim compared to the real bright ones. <laughs> it starts with an S. Saturn's a planet. Its name, Sirius. Yes, I'm serious. Its name is Sirius. S-I-R-I-U-S is how we spell it. We call it the dog star because it's part of the great dog constellation, Canis Major, seen up in the early evening winter sky. So what came first, the star or the satellite radio company? Don't we tend to name things after astronomical objects? The Ford Galaxy, the Mercury Comet. The point straight overhead, in astronomy, we call it the zenith. How many have had a Zenith television or radio before? Yeah. And what's the name of our galaxy? Milky Way. Milky Way. Sorry, candy bar lovers. <laughs> well, it's also been said that the handle of the Big Dipper arcs toward Arcturus, a big, bright orange color star seen in the summer sky. Anybody recognize this pattern? I think the bird does. He's chirping quite a bit. This is Orion the Hunter. How many have heard of Orion? Yeah, Orion is a winter constellation. And, you know, here's the brightest star in all of Orion. It's a red supergiant we call Betelgeuse. And down here in the lower right of Orion is the second brightest star, the beta star using the Greek alphabet. It's a blue star we call Rigel. And in between the two brightest stars, we see these three in a row forming the belt of the hunter. Now, he is a hunter looking for prey. So he does have a weapon. Below his belt, we see the sword of Orion. See, these three stars make it up his sword. And notice the middle of the three. Gee, it looks a bit fuzzy, doesn't it? That's because it's not a star at all, but it's a cloud. And the word for cloud in the Greek is nebula. So we call it the Orion Nebula. 1,500 light years away, it's literally our nearest stellar nursery where new stars are being born. Double stars like Albireo and Cygnus the Swan appear to be close together in the night sky, but thinking about it three-dimensionally, one star could be a lot further away from the Earth than the other. That's the case here, and that's where we immediately refer to it as an optical double. Notice the colors of the pair, however, orange and blue. Do you know an artist would call those complementary colors? They're opposites. And an artist would paint on the canvas of their painting, red representing hot areas, and blue cold. 
But for an astronomer, it's just the opposite. Red stars are the coolest stars. Blue stars are actually the hottest stars of them all. Most stars are not like the sun being a lone star, but are binary pairs or multiple star systems, like Alpha Centauri, our nearest star system to us. How many have heard of Alpha Centauri before? Yeah, it's 4.3 light years away, and it's our closest star. That's the same as saying 1.3 parsecs, or about 27 trillion miles to the nearest star of all. Boy, it's a big universe, isn't it? And here's an open star cluster. They're loose collections of tens to even hundreds of hot young stars, like the Pleiades star cluster seen here in the shoulder of Taurus the Bull. How many have heard of the Seven Sisters before? Yes, and Native American Indians call this the Seven Dancing Girls. But truthfully, there are 250 member stars in this cluster. Far outnumbering that, however, are member stars of a globular star cluster, like Messier 13, pictured here in Hercules, resolved right through the core by the Hubble Space Telescope of over a million old stars. I like to think of these globulars as sort of like chandeliers going around the center of our galaxy, way out in this region known as the halo. We see a few hundred of these there. We also see them routinely in other galaxies. Nebulae appear differently for the way they are formed. If the star blows out its outer layer into space as a roughly spherical shell of gas and dust, it will resemble somewhat the appearance of a planet. And that's why we call this type planetary nebulae. Notice the colors of Messier 57, the famous ring nebula in Lyra. They are real, and they tell us much of its chemical composition. Diffuse nebulae appear spread out like a puff of smoke, every which direction we look, like the Orion Nebula seen here, as it would appear in a modest-sized telescope like we, like we have looked through here. Would you like to see what it looks like in a really big observatory telescope? Looks more like that. On the left, Messier 43, we call it the Christmas Tree Nebula. A little early in the season still, but there it is. And here's Messier 42, the Great Orion Nebula, with large amounts of filamentous structure, features and details resolved throughout the entire cloud. And as we dive down even deeper into the heart of the cloud by the power of the Hubble Space Telescope, we now have photographic evidence of what we only theorized to exist decades ago, the existence of these protoplanetary disks. The gas and dust within the cloud coalesces together, begins to spin and rotate to conserve momentum, flattening like a pancake, drawing material from around it nearby, and that's what we call it an accretion disk. In the middle of our accretion disk, a new star will be born once it reaches a temperature of fusion, orbited about by new planets in a new stellar system. Well, if we could take a spacecraft into the Orion Nebula, it would look something like this. And notice in the heart of the cloud, we see these four bright stars known as the trapezium. They were born out of the cloud themselves. You can see the trapezium from home in even a small telescope. And also within the boundaries of Orion the Hunter, we can see this dark cloud with a brighter backdrop silhouette, almost curtain-like in appearance in this magnificent photo of it. What does that dark cloud look like to you? A ho of course it looks like a horse. What else does it look like? A what? The Trojan horse. A, the Trojan horse, absolutely. It looks just like that. What else does it look like? A seahorse. A seahorse. Of course it looks like a seahorse. I totally agree. Anything else? I have a... Of a I can, on my arm. I can see that. Oh, and that's cool. Yeah. It's on my skin. What? It's, oh. Uh, it's, oh, I thought you had it on your sweater, but it's on your skin. It's on my skin, and it's. Well, a take your. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a <birth laughs> Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, oh, how cool. So you, you, you really like this picture, don't I you? I do. All right. Well, the point is, astronomers have a vivid imagination. The Milky Way, the Big Bang. Come on. What do astronomers see when they look at that dark cloud? Well, the consensus in the community is a horse's head. 
So we call it the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. Personally, I think it looks like a night piece on a chess game or a seahorse. But as we zoom in on the Horsehead Nebula in Orion, you can almost hear the neigh of the horse. All right, well, here's our own Milky Way galaxy. And we believe in the core of our Milky Way lies a supermassive black hole. Notice these dark pocket regions seen here. They're not gaps between the stars like one may think, but they're thick, dense areas of gas and dust, opaque, blocking the starlight beyond. And as we pan out and come down one of the spiral arms of our own Milky Way toward our neck of the woods, we come back to Orion the Hunter. And once again, we see the Orion Nebula and the three belt stars vertically aligned. Let's turn them horizontal once again and zoom in a bit tighter. And now we can see, in, right near this end belt star, the Horsehead Nebula in proximity to the constellation, as well as the entire galaxy. This red glowing material we're seeing is ionized hydrogen in a region known as Barnard's Loop. As we come back to the Horsehead Nebula, you can see right next to this end belt star, this bright reflection nebula we call IC434. That stands for Index Catalog, one of our catalog systems in astronomy. And as we pan away to the Christmas tree and Orion nebulas again, this is not art, this is for real. As we dive down deep into the Orion nebula, we can see the cloud glowing brighter than ever seen before in history. And the stars of the trapezium shining brighter than ever seen before by human eyes. Now we paint another short span away to come to a Hubble photo that broke international headlines overnight. At first it looks like a UFO, but it's not a flying saucer. It's our accretion disk, as described, flat like a pancake, horizontal in our line of sight. We see the glow of a new star undergoing fusion both above and below the disk of material, from whence new planets will form, orbiting that new star in a new stellar system. Now, everything I've talked about up till now is inside of our own Milky Way galaxy. Way beyond the Milky Way are hundreds of billions of island universes known as galaxies. Like the Andromeda galaxy seen here, two million light years away, it's literally our nearest, one of our nearest neighboring galaxies to us. But too many lightness is an awful long distance. We're looking at the glow of its stars as they really appeared two million years ago in the past. How many remember those days? No, we don't go back that far, do we? Well, do you know, telescopes don't only reveal the invisible, they're also a time machine. They take us back in time. Two million years ago in history, a mere drop in the bucket compared to what the Hubble is showing us today, we're seeing stars that are 13.2 billion years old. Well, the Andromeda galaxy is a lot like our own Milky Way, being a spiral galaxy. It's bigger than we are, some 600 billion stars in that system. And notice the two smaller companion galaxies with Andromeda. We also have a couple of smaller companion galaxies with our own Milky Way. Who would have guessed that the Portuguese navigator sailing the southern seas a few hundred years ago, Ferdinand Magellan, would have had them named after himself for their discovery? How many heard of the clouds of Magellan? The large and small Magellanic clouds. Of high interest to all, because relatively speaking, they are so close. And as we zoom into the core of the Andromeda galaxy, we're reminded that we're in a collision course with it. How many have heard that before? It's true. You can write it down. We in the Milky Way are going to collide with the Andromeda. Don't worry, not for four billion years from now. Today we're off the hook. We don't have to lose sleep over this tonight. But four billion years later, we're going to have to contend with a galactic collision. Can we survive it? We can, actually. We can survive it. And what a view we would have. It's only four billion years. How many can't wait? Yeah. All right. Well, how big is the universe and how small can it really get? Well, to get more precise answering those questions, let's go back a couple of thousand years ago in the days of Jesus, when a Greek philosopher was alive called Democritus. Do you know what Democritus thought when he looked at a structure like a building or a house? 
that it can be broken down to a tiny, basic, fundamental building block. He called it in the Greek, atomos, A-T-O-M-O-S, where we get our English word atom from. Atomos, literally defined, means indivisible. You've heard that word before. One nation, under God, indivisible. What does it mean to be indivisible? Can't take it apart. Can't take it apart? Yeah. Undividable. We can't divide it up any further. We can't break it any smaller. We can't cut it into smaller pieces. Wait a minute. Is that true of the atom? No, we know better. We know the atom can be split, don't we? Well, if this entire room here was an atom, most of it by far would be empty space. And traveling very quickly around this room would be tiny, negative electrically charged particles called electrons. In the center of the room would reside the nucleus. So small on this scale, it would be smaller than the sharp pointed end of a needle. And yet, 99.9% .9 of the entire mass of this room size atom is in that little nucleus. What makes it so heavy in there? Positive electrically charged protons and zero or neutral neutrons. These nucleons, as we like to call them, can be broken down into even smaller pieces of matter known as quarks. Well, to date, we've identified hundreds of these subatomic particles. Gee, sort of means that the word atom doesn't live up to its own definition at all anymore, does it? It's anything but indivisible. How many say we should change the name immediately, if not sooner? How many say, no, leave Adam alone? It's been with us 2,000 years. It's the way I learned it in school. It's the way my children learn. It's the way my grandkids are learning. How many say we should just leave Adam alone? Good news, everyone. We have left Adam alone. It's still in a dictionary. It still means indivisible. It's still an atom. Gee, should we have applied that same reasoning to the planet Pluto? Anyhow, we can come back to that if you want. Now, our bodies are made up of hundreds of trillions of cells. And the old yell, feed me, feed me, keep breathing, right? Wants oxygen, wants food, nutrients. All those cells. And an atom is much smaller than a human cell. If we could put atoms in a straight line path, how many do you think it would take to go across the thickness or diameter of one average human cell? Any guesses? Don't be shy now. Nobody's wrong here. We're all friends, right? How about 100,000? And going bigger still, how many human cells will go in a straight line path from the bottom of our feet all the way up to the top of our head if our average adult hot height, five foot eight inches. How many? How about a hundred thousand? And then going bigger still, how many people standing on top of each other's head, can you picture that, would stretch across the earth 8,000 miles wide? Do I have any volunteers, please? <laughs> oh, you guys are too smart for that, I guess. How many volunteers are we really going to need, though? Uh, there's an educated guess for you. Hey, we're on a trend here, right? But this is where the trend changes, I'm afraid. How many volunteers are we really going to need? <clears throat> Ten million. That's a lot of volunteers. And don't you feel sorry for that bottom one? Boy, they're going to have a bad headache when this is done, right? Nor even you still, how many Earths will go from the sun to the edge of the solar system? Let's call it 3.67 billion miles. Ten million. And going bigger still, how many solstices will go across the entire Milky Way galaxy? How wide is the Milky Way? From one spiral arm edge to the other, it's 100,000 light years in diameter. Remember a light year 6 trillion miles? 600 quadrillion miles across the Milky Way. How many solstices would fit across that expanse? 100 million. 10 million. You weren't far off there. Good job. And my largest question today is, how many Milky Ways edge to edge would it take to go across the entire known, detectable, observable universe in a three-dimensional understanding? How many? How many think it's a really big number, like billions? That's why this might be a bit surprising. Yeah, so big is our Milky Way. 
But I'll tell you something even more surprising than that. Going from the very small an atom to the very large, the entire universe, if we could again, how many atoms would stretch across the whole universe? Well, wouldn't it be all these numbers multiplied together? Yes, of course it would. Here's the number. Oh, yeah, that's one followed by 36 zeros. One times 10 to the 36th power. They should have a TV show called Name That Number. Anybody know the name of that number? Any guesses? A lot. A lot! That's right. I thought somebody might say Google or Googleplex. It's part of one. It's called one undecillion. One undecillion atoms was stretched across the entire universe. Good grief. Looking at it from another perspective, these are models, size scale accurate of the planets going out in order from the sun. First Mercury, then Venus. Here we are, the third rock from the sun, and then Mars. And then, wait a minute, what's he doing here? How did he sneak into this picture? Poor Pluto. He likes some equal time. What does Pluto have in common with these other four worlds? Amongst other things, like Roberta's saying, they're all rocky, solid, terrestrial type worlds, we call them. They all have a solid ground to stand on. The other four don't. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, you'd fall through like a cloud. But not these. Well, who's the biggest one of our rocky, terrestrial worlds? Yeah, hey, the world's a big place after all, isn't it? How many have traveled the world in their life? Anybody here travel the world? It's a big world we're in. I've been to China. I think that's about halfway around, right? So uh, I tried. But anyhow, here's all the here's uh, these rocky terrestrial worlds. And isn't the Earth big? Oh no! Look at the Earth now. And poor Pluto, reduced to the size of a pea on this scale compared to the Jovian worlds against giant planets. Uranus, Neptune, Saturn without its rings. Look at Jupiter. The great red spot alone bigger than the Earth. A 300 mile an hour wind cyclonic storm discovered by Galileo Galilei over 400 years ago. We have no idea when the storm began before he found it. Still going on today, though some of you may have heard it's beginning to diminish. Well, all the other worlds combined don't equal the mass or volume of Jupiter the biggest planet by far in the entire solar system. Isn't Jupiter big? Oh no! Look at Jupiter now. And look at the Earth, a mere dot on this scale. Poor Pluto. A mere speck of dust compared to our star, the Sun. A million kilometers wide, 865,000 miles in diameter. It dwarfs the planets like little pebbles of rock. After all, the sun is a star, and on average, stars are enormous. The sun being no exception to that rule, like you may once have heard. Well, is it the sun big? No, look at the sun now. Next to Sirius, the brightest star we identified earlier, it's rather a dwarf. And look at Pollux and Gemini, the twins, much bigger than the sun. And look over here, remember I mentioned him earlier, Arcturus? He really is an orange color star. Do you know he's so big the orbit of Mercury would fit inside of that star? Well, isn't Arcturus big? Oh no, look at Arcturus now. <laughs> Next to Rigel and Orion, he's rather a shrimp. And look at Betelgeuse and Orion the Hunter, a red supergiant so large, the orbit of Jupiter would fit inside of that star. And look over here, everyone, Antares. The name means the rival of Mars, because it looks like Mars in the sky without a telescope, a bright red star. Here in the constellation Scorpius of Scorpion, look at the size of Antares compared to the... Wait a minute, what happened to the sun? It says sun one pixel. We can't see one pixel with our eyes. In other words, when Antares is that big on the screen, the sun is microscopic in comparison. Well... Isn't Antares big? Well, presenting the largest star discovered to date. Its name, V.Y. Canis Majoris. Its size, a billion with a B, suns, would fit inside of V.Y. Canis Majoris. The biggest star discovered by, by astronomers to date. 
Now, is it be why Canis Majoris big? But much bigger than the largest star discovered are these island universes known as galaxies, each containing on average hundreds of billions of stars, from the smallest dwarfs to the largest supergiants. Galaxies form in groups and clusters, even superclusters, containing thousands of galaxies. In its more recent Hubble Extreme D field image, we're looking at galaxies out a distance of 13.2 billion light years. Charles Messier was a French astronomer a couple hundred years ago who uh, was known as a voracious comet hunter. A list was compiled of 110 Messier objects. Not for being comets, however, but for being other than. This list of galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters is still widely used today. Messier 1, the Crab Nebula in Taurus the Bull, a supernova remnant, the remains of an exploding star we can see even in the daytime sky back in the year 1054 AD. And the stellar corpse remnant left behind, one of the first images I worked with from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, we call it the Crab Nebula Pulsar. Messier 8, the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius. When we look in that direction in the summertime night sky, we're looking back toward the center core of our own Milky Way. Like diamonds set in black velvet. So beautiful are these open star clusters such as M11 seen here. M16, the Flying Eagle Nebula, what looks like the wings of an eagle there in the middle, here enlarged later by the Hubble. How many remember this picture when it broke international headlines on television? We call it the Pillars of Creation. For lack of a better term, we call those pillars in astronomy elephant trunks. And on the tops of them, the embryonic stages of new stars glowing by fusion. M17, the Swan or Omega Nebula, sometimes we have different names for the same object. Messier 20, the Triffin Nebula, notice not only different colors in the clouds, but different types of clouds as well. Messier 27, a planetary nebula. Notice the central star giving rise to the cloud. M33, a face-on spiral galaxy in triangulum. From our view here on the Earth, galaxies can appear this way, or edgewise to our view, or anywhere in between for that matter. Messier 44, the beehive or price of each star cluster, found in Cancer the Crab. Isn't this a beauty? Messier 51, we call it the Whirlpool Galaxy. M64, the Black Eye Galaxy, giving rise to its name, the Dark Dust Lane near the center there. Here in large later by the Hubble, we now see evidence of new star-forming regions amongst this cold, dark, dead dust. M76, a colorful nebula seen in Perseus. M81 is a beautiful spiral galaxy, not far from the Big Dipper in the sky. And right near that one is M82, a completely different appearing galaxy altogether. Likewise with M83, a barred spiral galaxy seen in Hydra. We think our own Milky Way is a barred spiral. M97, the Owl Nebula. Woo! Can you see the owl? Maybe with the Hubble color view. M101, a face-on spiral galaxy we commonly call the pinwheel for obvious reasons. Edgewise to our view is M104, the sombrero galaxy. And the rim of our Mexican hat, again resolved by the Hubble in the new stars. Beyond the Messier list, there are other catalogs of objects. I want to show you a few samples of them, like the Hourglass Nebula. And for those who have cats at home and a vivid imagination, we call this the Cat's Eye Nebula. The North American Nebula. Can you see Mexico, Texas, Florida, New York, California? You didn't know we were up in the night sky, did you? On the left, the friendly face of an Eskimo is revealed in the Eskimo Nebula. On the right, the same object is viewed by the Hubble. It looks so different, we came up with another name for it as well. Galaxies and the myriads of objects they contain, many of which I've described for you in today's program, we all marvel at the views of these objects taken by our great detectors. 
But there are many of us who ask large numbers of questions regarding the laws of physics associated with these objects found throughout the depths of space. Galaxies do collide, like the antenna galaxies seen here on the left side of our screen, photographed by a large observatory telescope in the past, and large on the right by the Hubble in much greater detail. You might be tempted to believe of the hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy while they're colliding, that many of those stars would bump into one another. But no two stars are likely to collide at all. So vast is the space between the stars. You'd have a better chance mathematically of two flies bumping heads in a football field than that happening here. Galaxies do collide. We're on a collision course ourselves. One to two billion years later, they finally settle down and merge together as a new system, typically an elliptical type galaxy. Galaxies out to the furthest stretches of the known universe, 13.82 billion light years. Here's our beautiful blue marble Earth as we come back home. Though it seems suspended in space, the Earth weighs in at some 6,000 million, million, million tons. Our beautiful sapphire jewel, we would have never realized how beautiful it appeared from space until the Apollo astronauts leaving Earth's orbit en route to the moon. Then we found out. strings to the entire cosmos. The universe is truly incredible. In conclusion, I'd like to quote Walt Whitman with a backdrop of the Lawrence tree as painted by Georgia O'Keeffe. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. What our friend Mr. Whitman is telling us in his poem, I believe, is it's great to listen to a talk about the universe, but it's much better still to experience it firsthand for ourselves. Thank you so much for your time and attention, everyone.